Cerberus takes a lot of the stuff that was in Tempo. So it has a very similar sharding scheme, uh, a lot of the technology that was in Tempo, such as the Radix engine and all that kind of stuff is all very similar or takes kind of inspiration from. I suppose the main difference with Cerberus versus what Tempo was trying to do is that it's a active multi-degree consensus mechanism. And so multi-degree means that you have nodes that are voting. So, um, and then you generally count those votes. And if you breach some threshold um, of agreement or disagreement, which is generally a super majority of the people who have voted, uh, the nodes that have voted, then your transaction, your event, whatever it is you're doing, gets committed to the ledger. Um, and if a super majority disagree, then it doesn't get committed to the ledger. And so by, by driving with the supermajority and nodes voting on what they think the truth is, is essentially what a multi-decree consensus mechanism does. And that provides the foundation for Cerberus. Um, now, there's some other kind of intricacies around consensus mechanisms. You've got BFT SMRs, which stands for Byzantine Fault Tolerance State Machine Replicators, which is something that Cerberus does, but we won't get There are similar technologies to to what is at the core of, of Cerberus already. Tendermint, Cosmos, Hot Stuff. Uh, there's there's previous um, BFT SMRs from, from decades ago. There's Lamport, Paxos. There's quite a few uh, implementations of, of what is at the core of Cerberus, but where Cerberus shines is by taking the sharding model that we had in Tempo and applying that consensus mechanism in a novel way so that we can scale it linearly. And so usually when you're running with two or three phase commit BFT consensus mechanisms, you have a single instance of that consensus function running that consensus process. And what we're able to do with Cerberus is run multiple ones of them in parallel on the same machine and run machines that are running multiple instances of this BFT consensus mechanism across the network as well. So if you've got a thousand nodes and they're all running a thousand instances, then you have a million different BFT instances, which theoretically would mean you could run a million TPS. You mentioned that, you know, sort of the, the most important part of it is the fact that we've used the, the sharding techniques that we developed before for Tempo and applied it to this, this sort of this, this BFT class of, of consensus. And I think, uh, you know, one of the really interesting innovations about this is it's a system that uh, allows, you know, it treats the, 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 the whole point of the sharding that we've, we've been working on for quite some time is this idea of massive sharding from the beginning, not sort of trying to apply sharding as this incremental thing to an existing, you know, you've already got a single chain that's already doing Nakamoto consensus. Let's try to add some side chains or something on that to make it scale better. The whole Radix concept is doing it massive scale from the beginning, because that's where, you know, you need to go anyway. So doing that is fairly tricky. Um, and I think the, the, one of the clever things about consensus is it's a, it's a design that allows these, you know, millions, billions, quadrillions of parallel shards that you need to do that, that scalability to kind of connect and act as, as consensus state machines um, as needed. So whereas, uh, you know, there are a lot of, I think, kind of the traditional research and a lot of consensus is the concept is you have one state machine, it's conducting consensus, it's going on to the next step, very blockchain-like. This is saying, well, look, you can do most of this stuff completely in parallel, it's not related. But what we do is I think a lot of the consensus design that you'll see in the white paper is linking together the shards only whenever you need to, and having them kind of act like a uh, a single consensus machine for a for a limited period of time before they split up. Usually, when referring to the kind of consensus mechanism that Cerberus is, people say BFT, and then you've got Nakamoto consensus. And so BFT actually means Byzantine fault tolerant. And so Bitcoin is Byzantine fault tolerant as are all the, all the blockchains. So it's, it's, it's not really the correct term. I've seen some comments on Telegram where people said, oh, it's BFT, so it's, it's nothing new, it's blah, blah. And it's like, well, actually, you're actually just stating a, a function of the consensus mechanism, which is that it's Byzantine fault tolerant. Mm -hmm. um, so the correct term is two and three phase commit, uh, multi-degree consensus mechanism. But that's a bit long, so everyone just shortens it to BFT generally. But can you give me, and this time I'm going to hold you to it, a one sentence description of why Cerberus is exciting? 
Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's the first three phase commit sharded consensus mechanism that can do linear scaling. It's a, you know, a, a secure, fast consensus system that gives you linear scalability for billions of users. Um, it's, this is really what it manages to deliver using a lot of, uh, a lot of our own innovation, as well as some of the, the best research that's going on in the field right now, kind of collecting it all together. It's, that's why it's exciting to me. What Cerberus can do, there are a lot of questions around what from Tempo has remained. So we've got sharding being one yep. of the main ones. Yeah, the shard model. It's it's slightly tweaked with Cerberus as well. So um it's it's a bit it's gone through some improvements while we had the opportunity. We had there were there, there were some pending ideas that would just have been very difficult to shoehorn into tempo as it was. So um Cerberus was an opportunity for us to make those those improvements. Other than sharding, what else is so the Radix engine, of course, plays a big part, even though it's not seen. And it wasn't, it's not really a thing. It's more of a theoretical abstract thing, all the kind of data architecture that, that Tempo brought along, all that, all that kind of that stuff on how things are stored to the ledger, how things are referenced, how things associate with each other. That's very key to being able to do this. I would say probably the most important thing is the data architecture and the sharding model that allows you to get to this linear scalability because without them, you just, you just couldn't do it. Less exciting stuff around the networking layer and messaging and all that kind of stuff that we spent a lot of time optimizing over the, over the years, all that's obviously come over as well and gives a nice solid foundation for us to build up on top of innovations that we did in, uh, the gossip mechanism is very useful. Logical clocks, um, also play a role. Like just tons and tons of the tempo stuff comes over those concepts around separating related and unrelated transactions also play a very big part in being able to achieve this linear scale how does cerberus reduce risk and improve implementation timeline you know there's 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 this piece at the bottom that's very risky to mess with and if we can use something there then we can apply all of the huge amount of innovation that we brought into tempo and wrap it around that kernel and this both reduces the amount of risk that that machine is going to operate exactly the way we expect it to every time um, as well as you know reducing our implementation risk so it's it's a it's a win-win whereas with cerberus we can go for a single instance um cerberus process per machine and then we can scale it up to multiple Cerberus instances per machine on, on a later job once we've, once we've done that work. And then the third stage of that is, okay, now we can have multiple instances per machine and a sharded network too. So all different nodes are serving different portions of the ledger and that's kind of stage three. Instead of having to do everything right first time, we can, we can, we can baby step it through to make sure that the network is secure and that we are catching things that we should be catching and that nothing gets missed. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, service is really nicely modular in that way. Is it, it very cleanly separates Sybil? It cleanly separates your consensus and the sharding layer. All those things we can we can roll those things out step by step and be really confident in what we're doing. Are there any scalability limitations? Are there limitations around running a node? How does that come into play? Um, I wouldn't say there were any limitations around scalability. It's it's designed to be linearly scalable, so. Your limitation is basically how many nodes you can throw at the network. That's your kind of ultimate limit. Um, there are some considerations and um, there are some things that uh, we still need to figure out for the, for the later RPN releases around things like um, message complexity and are we, are, are, do we want to use these things called threshold signatures? It basically means that you can, you can capture more votes in a small amount of data when you send a message so that it doesn't bottleneck everybody's bandwidth or their CPU and stuff like that. Um, but they're all kind of more practical things. They're not really limitations to the theory or, or, or to the architecture as such. Um, and even if we were to go with a less efficient kind of signature model, for example, then you just throw more nodes at the network and you can still achieve your, your scale. You know, how, how efficient is it per node? And then the other lever is how many nodes in the network do I need to have in order to hit that? that target threshold of throughput that I'm looking for. Um, so in terms of scale, there's not really any any upper upper bound on 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 how fast these these things can go. It's more about how fast can the individual nodes go and that kind of dictates um, things like how many nodes can collaborate together to come to consensus, 
what's the throughput of those nodes? How you know how 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 many how many consensus processes can a node be part of at any one given amount of time? And the shardability kind of addresses that as well. I mean, you look at something like EOS, where they're they're you know they put a lot of work in making sure that they've got these that they're they're what is it twenty three or whatever validators are I think is twenty one yeah they're they're on these very high bandwidth links and they're closely connected together like they've they've really focused on optimizing how the performance of those twenty one nodes which is one way of approaching it but I mean what we're doing is basically saying well once we once this is sharded you don't need to worry about that anymore because you you're just going to have you, you just parallelize parallelization is the is the the name of the game for reaching scale absolutely so, what are the security limitations of cerberus the the security threshold of, of cerberus is that if i've got uh, more than 33 percent of all the vote power in the network then i can basically control the network i can install what's called liveness and i can break safety liveness is where things continue to happen. If you stop that, nothing in the network happens. And safety is a double spend, for example, right? And, and that's, that's largely the same for all, for all multi-degree uh, consensus mechanisms. The, the upper bound on security is 33% of Byzantine tolerance. For Nakamoto star consensus, it's, uh, it can be higher, um, but there are, there's usually some trick you can do to bring it back down to to a 33% kind of rule. So a 51% attack is only true under certain operating conditions. So generally, if you've got somebody somewhere who owns 33% of compute, of economic votes, of anything, 33% of votes by any means, then they win. Where, where potential issues come into play with things like civil is that um, proof of stake um, if I have deep pockets, I can acquire tokens and there's no real limit to how many tokens I can buy, um, over time. And you generally with that kind of, of, of civil protection mechanism, as we've seen with mining and with proof of stake is that you just generally tend to get a centralization, right? The, the rich get richer, whether it's economic power, compute power, whatever it is, especially if you have a competitive reward scheme as part of your economics. If you took the block reward away from Bitcoin, then the centralization of Bitcoin would look completely different. Um, the same with proof, various proof of stake models. If you take the block reward away um, and, your, and your proof of stake uh, centralization would also look different. So that's something we've still got to kind of dig into and figure out what that looks like on Cerberus using um, proof of stake um, and figure out does it centralize? Are there, is there any reason for it to centralize? What are the incentives that make it centralize? And, and how does that affect things? Thank you guys for jumping on. Bye. Bye. -bye.